kick off with some questions on the floor. These, these are on. Yeah, there must be somebody I'm irritated in the audience. Go on, have a go. I suppose when actually I, I, I first, um, such a long time ago, in, in the 80s and the 90s sort of joined, then uh, we used to have these big research labs like IBM and Philips and so forth. And actually people moved between the two very comfortably and we used to have that sort of very nice, I think, flow between the, t between the two. Um, come, you know, the sort of... Uh, the current era, I don't see that. There's not, not that set up anymore. You know, there's a, a now the, the big companies don't have big research organisations anymore. You know, they look to the world of startups to create new their new technologies. They're ready to pick them, pick the, pick pick them pick them up. So I think industry has changed. I don't think academic academic the academic institutes have particularly changed, but I think the way industry sort of uh, used to foster probably internally also quite an academic uh, uh, sort of culture in their, in their research labs. That, that has completely dis dis disappeared there. So perhaps that's one point. Okay. Melissa, would you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, so I think, I guess, I guess the role of money is a difference um, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, I think there is there is at the same time, and it, I'm, I'm speaking very specifically, I guess, about what we did. But um, so you know, when you're when you're doing research, um, you know, the end goal after uh, a project or a bunch of years of PhD is to produce a body of knowledge, mm -hmm. um, and in a sense, that is actually quite similar to what we were trying to do within um, Made by Many, because uh, this was an IoT project. Um, Normally, you know, this is the first sort of physical product that we made. Um, we normally only do digital, and this is sort of digital physical. Um, so we're really trying to sort of understand that space and see how, uh, as a company, we could fit into that space and what that would mean for our process. Um, so I think I think it's very similar in the sense that you know when you do design research, very often it's also not just looking at you know making a product, but it's also looking at the making of the product and and how certain processes produce certain outcomes um, so so I do I do think that that can be quite similar actually surprisingly um, because you know for us it was also about sharing it back you know um, you might share it in papers uh, when you're doing academic research but we would share it in blog posts so it's about sharing the um, the knowledge that you're building up about your processes within industry rather than within academia um, but at the same time, I think there's a difference in the sense that um, even though we were doing this as an in-house project and we were sort of self-financing this for a lot of, uh, a lot of the time, um, I think there was always sort of, the, there, was, there was always a sword hanging over it in the sense of like, are we going to cut this project at some point? <laughs> Have we done enough learning and do we mm -hmm. now not maybe care about the product anymore? Um, so, so actually, you know, the research outcomes were always sort of, uh, you know, there, there was there was always another point where we had a meeting about, you know, do we want to take it to the next level of actually building this thing? Um, and whilst I think that, you know, within academia, you you probably, you know, you have a budget or you have a PhD, and it's it's it's, it's a bit more sort of set in time. Whilst with us, it was always sort of like, are we ready to put more money into this? And I think it's a different question. Thank you, and Peter, from the academic side, what would you say the differences are? Are we there? Yep, yep. Um, I think it's time scale mm. is my, for me. Um, I've just started putting dates in my diary for 2020 now. When you talk about will the project survive for another two months, mm -hmm. that's a difference. Um, but 
thinking about 2020 already starting to impinge on my life is possibly a, a bad thing as well as a good one. I don't have the freedom to move in quite the same way. And I think in terms of setups for academic careers, yeah. um, time is everything. So people are expected to have had long periods of time working on things before they go up to the next level. Um, and I think that that possibly is problematic because I think able people lose out because they can't present that. Mm -hmm. And Max, would you have anything to add? <coughs> what I see is the um, missing link between research and industry. From my perspective or my experience, uh, for instance, uh, industry, they really, really want to know more uh, about what you're doing. Uh, they, they, they want the innovation. But when they really start to talk to uh, re research people, they found out your, your things are really good but do a little bit too much. Maybe you stop <laughs> there. And then, but my, my experience is research people, uh, not, not, it's like all group, you only talk to your group. So when you mentioned about co-work, co I, I feel that is something missing in my PowerPoint. I should emphasize the co-work because from the cap capital side, they want good innovation, disruptive innovation, but uh, research side, you deliver something your people understand. And while I bring that to industry, they say it doesn't work, you need to start from scratch. But then research people start worrying about uh, the money. So it's like, the girl chasing boy, boy chasing girls, and y you don't work together. Mm -hmm. So uh, how can we find a solution to solve this problem? Great, thank you. Um, are there any questions from the floor? Otherwise, Eve, oh Eve, there um, we go. We, we've got two questions. One is from the audience, I just got an email. Uh, the first one is to all of you. Uh, in terms of, because the students here in Royal College of Art, a lot of um, us are actually doing collaborations, either um, designers with designers or designers with artists or designers with engineers. And when the very early stage when we're generating ideas and we come with, come with ideas and concepts and perhaps designs together, is, in that, is it very, very necessary to state like who does what? as a statesman, like do we have to protect everything as an individual, then coming to the group at the very early stage? This is the question from, yeah, from a very academic student's point of view to you guys in the industry and academic professions. Thank you. Anyone can say <laughs> <laughs> There must be fights or arguments somewhere. I mean, there must be. I, if, if you have a t you have a team and and it's a cross disciplinary team, then yeah, then people do bring you know their own domain knowledge. I mean that's part of what they're contributing to to the team. So but, you know um, there is at least a, a loose understanding of what the roles pe people play, but quite then how you get the most out of that. I think that's where you know you need to sort of think very very carefully. When when we first bought you know uh, fashion design, textiles, and and hardware and software engineers together. Actually, we didn't have a methodology for starting a project. We didn't know what to do. And in the end, actually, the fashion designer took the lead and said, you know, I just can't work on a project unless I know who it's for, what are these technologies going to be used for. And so she then created a sort of like a, a little workshop, and we brought all the engineers in, and, and they just played scenarios about, well, what could the future actually look like? You know, if you're an air hostess, what sort of technology might you need on your clothes, those sorts of things. And that sort of... Uh, was a way of getting it uh, you know, sort of off the, gr off the ground. But, you know, and people could, within that environment, sort of bring their own domain knowledge into that sort of space. You know, the engineer could say what was probably feasible, and the, uh, the designers were coming up with ideas about you know, how you could construct clothes that could, could be useful for an air hostess, just as just an example. So, so I think, yeah, roles loosely are, are, are important. I think perhaps more important is, the, is the, the framework that allows them to sort of interact and share. Um. I want to say there's an issue about respect and it comes back to the issue about co-design. Um, just because somebody doesn't know what you know about 
a subject doesn't necessarily mean that their voice isn't, shouldn't be heard. Because sometimes when you're undertaking a project, it's the person that asks, why are we doing this very basic thing that a particular practice has always used is the breakthrough. Um, I'm never sure if it's apothecal or not, but the story about the US spending an enormous amount of money to develop a ballpoint pen that would write in zero gravity. Mm -hmm. And then they asked the Russians, how did you solve it? We use pencils. Mm -hmm. uh, it's that sort of alternative thinking that comes from not actually following on the details, but actually thinking about the structural, the central distance, difference that you can find in a team when you discuss. But when people say, I am the expert about this, actually what you do is tell everybody else you know nothing about this, so shut up. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, you have to be very careful about stating that you know things without stopping other people from actually providing, with, providing you with some sort of commentary or discussion. I think if you, so within the company that I work at, um, and it, you know, you've got different, different cultures within different companies. Um, but I think, I think on the one hand, there's enough difference in specialities between people um, that everybody knows quite well to listen to each other and also um, that everybody knows that we're not going to achieve anything without each other. Um, so, so obviously, you know, it's a constant back and forth between uh, people telling each other sort of the boundaries of what they can, the, what they can offer, and you know what they think is advisable. Um, and within those boundaries that you constantly set for each other, you kind of have a, a back and forth of ideas. Um, and you know, like obviously, there's sometimes a, a very specific idea that comes from someone. And I think what happens with us is that you know within within the company and within the team you know you will you will sort of champion each other so you will say like oh this other person had this amazing idea about x and we should definitely do this so it's not so much about you having to defend your claim as much as just everybody sort of defending for each other um, but then as soon as you sort of start talking about this product outside of this this sort of safe space of uh, everybody playing around this topic um, you know, you become the company, so you kind of you set up a front, um, and you know, there's there's probably I don't know, 15 people within our company plus another four probably within Map, and then another three people that we hired specifically. So you know, like there's there's a group of 20 people that I represent when I'm talking about this product, and I'm I'm not gonna you know say like oh this one person said <laughs> did this particular thing. You know, it doesn't it doesn't matter because everybody has shared ownership. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it means that I can come here and talk comfortably about what we did, and 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 show it. And you know, like if people are specifically interested, I can always tell them. You know, I did this particular thing, and you know, this decision was mine. But in the end, it doesn't really matter, I think, because everybody, you know, everybody benefits from the success, and everybody can put this the success of this on their CV. And it wouldn't have happened without them, and it wouldn't have happened without the other people. <laughs> Thank you. I believe we had a question yeah, from yes. the floor here. Yes, so that's a... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I did, but I might not need that, but okay. Hi, uh, I think it, my, my initial thought, though obviously most people probably had about a million thoughts before, since Evie talked about uh, your question, I, I felt it was to do a lot to do with labelling, and uh, please forgive me, and thank you for all your very interesting talks, but I was very conscious all the time of labelling. And I know it's really hard to give a presentation without labeling, because I have to present myself. But I think, um, you know, and I'm speaking, I've got the hat on today, I suppose, of being a visiting tutor at the Royal College of, of Art. And, and one of my uh, things is to get students to resist labeling at all costs, resist it, or to, um, it's almost like to, I suppose, to come to something, I don't really know how to explain it, someone said on an equal playing field, I don't, I don't even want to say that, but it's that idea of, I think, in, in some ways it surprises me that we're sitting here talking about creative practice as, and being a new, a new area of research, because it's always existed, and I think it's, it's come to prominence now 
because possibly because creatives have at last found a voice to stick their heads over the parapet and go, yay, we've done that. But uh, I, I'm lost, I'm losing my train of thought. Sorry, everybody, rambling mm -hmm. on. <laughs> but resist labels, and I, I say to my students a lot, uh, I want a lot of critical thinking, a lot of critical thinking, but also I want them to, and this is critical thinking, to learn through the make. And I think when you're getting people collaborating, that's the make. Them coming together is them acting as like materials of some description. So they're learning through the make of interaction. They're learning what each other can do. So, but they, they mustn't kind of label each other did, or label themselves. They, mm -hmm. must, they must have that breathing space to let things come in. Does that make sense to any student here? <laughs> Sack me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, sorry, just got another question in. Um, I think this one is to Peter. Um, what is the boundary between research and digital ethnography? Ooh. What's the, what's the what is the boundary between oh sorry, there's a UX, which I have no idea what it means. US initial for yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, so it was just about around, so you have, it's, it's kind of within the themes that mm. we were just discussing around boundaries, so you have in industry, uh, a cross-functional agile team, maybe if you're developing a digital product, perhaps, and you have a UX researcher as mm. part of that team, um, they're basically providing the same service, potentially, as a digital ethnographer. You have those ideas of, you know, timeline, and mm. it may be a longitudinal study and that sort of thing, but what you were touching on in your topic was about uh, potentially forcing user needs on people and developing products and leading them. Mm -hmm. So where is the boundary uh, ethically yeah. between a UX researcher and a digital ethnographer? And would there ever be a place for a digital ethnographer or a design ethnographer or you know something of that nature with that kind of level of academic rigor within a commercial cross-functional collaborative team? Does that make any sense? Certainly mm -hmm. does. Oh, yeah. good. <laughs> um, I think it possibly comes back to the issue of labels. Why can't you have someone who's both? Why, th and this is part of, we present, um, you know, I present the whole idea about ethnography and how the term has changed over time. Now, the, one of the issues you get from anthropologists is, are terms being hijacked? The issue is that it's being used in a different way by a different group. And the reason you have a label is because you know what you expect from something. If you have a CEO of the company, they're liable for the company's accounts. The person who sits on the reception desk isn't. So the reason they're there is partially what you expect from people. And companies are not inherently moral things. I don't actually want to say that a company should be doing a good thing. What I should say is, the people in the company should be doing a thing, good thing. Let's personalize it. And that's one of the problems that society in Western Europe tends to have these, and, and this is particularly to do with my research, people blame companies for doing this, that, and the other. But actually what they don't do is say, the people who lead those companies didn't have the vision to say that this was wrong and that is right. So it's actually, that aspect of the label, I think anybody who engages in risk, who collects data about other people should be mindful to some extent of what they are doing. They're not just a data collector, they're collecting bits of people's lives and they may be using them to make their lives worse. And they have to make that moral choice. Now whether you label that person, someone as a data collector or whether you say they're a digital ethnographer, it doesn't matter. They're still doing a similar thing and they still may be causing the same amount of damage. So the label doesn't matter, it's the activity is what I'm questioning. And I can say this from a point of view, not having to make that decision at that point in time. I know when you are at the point of having to make that decision, it's very, very hard. All ethical decisions are. But I think the point is that in these areas where there's overlap, we have a number of jobs that have changed in nature and start to actually have different responsibilities than they used to. But it's actually being aware of what your actions entail and what might flow from them, which is the important part. Does that provide some sort of answer? Or just worry it even more? <laughs> okay.
<laughs> My second question um, is, is related to um, part of my research because I'm doing the um, learning, teaching and learning that's based on the um, uh, sort of uh, practice as, as my key practice here in RCA. So can, um, can any one of you share about the main challenge that you're facing when you are either teaching um, creativity to, or to the creativity or collaborating to the creativity? The main challenge personally. start from Max. <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, <clears throat> I think labeling and ethic issue might be the one, one, two main topic between, let's say, different perspective. Uh, from a capital perspective, from company's perspective, you want, sometimes you want different things from designers from um, the research people, uh, capital turns to see the, we call it ROI, return of investment, and company wants cash flow, you want survive, and if you can uh, rip, rip off more people, your company tends to make more money. Um, so with, there, there is conflict in, in, in general. Like, uh, so actually I don't, in a way I don't really know how to so solve So creativity this comes, mm. we all ha eventually have to compromise when we're teaching creativity. Mm. We have to think about what happened afterwards with the career choices or with the money flow. Is it something we have to have in mind or? or no, I, I, to, to be honest, in my experience and what I see is <coughs> people, that's in a way that's the 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 missing part. Like like research and designers, you don't you don't normally think to the end. You don't you don't start your research. You don't think about uh, media communication, marketing strategies, or campaign you're going to do. It's for for example, Melissa doing this uh, hack hackabo. At the end, you want to go into Kickstarter, then you start to think, okay, how are, how are you communicate with mass media? How are we talking to the target audience? But we now we are trying to re, we call it re-engineering. We will start from the day you kick off this project. We have think all through and put everyone sit together, discuss the possibilities, and then start to run it. But it doesn't mean it will be successful even we do this pre-planning so much at the end still failed because maybe in the the process someone is angry or someone is not happy with what you're doing you you're too dirty you you're not good or capital thinking you're too slow why why we need to be so perfect that's the difficult between uh, creative and the real real world Okay, um, it's a bit more prosaic as working with, with my students. Actually, when we used to do the, the workshop in two weeks, so everybody just used to arrive, and then we used to uh, just sort of, they have to sort of uh, come up with the ideas actually at that time and under a lot of pressure and things. Actually, the students actually were, I always imagine they were actually very creative at that time. And then now that we are with the department, we want a lot more research and things behind it. So I have, this, as I mentioned, this, this two months now. And so we go through this whole process with the, the you know, student generating a wider major of ideas and just helping them come down to a final sort of uh, sort of idea, which is, is then sort of t taken forward. And yeah, I, in a way, I, know I don't know the answer to this. Sometimes I, I feel that that process, even though we've had more time and things, and I'm trying not to impose my sort of bias on this, trying to get the student to sort of come up and say, like, well, which one do you think? You know, which one uh, you know, sort of fits the, uh, you know, the, the, the design brief, brief, the, brief the most? I, I, I sometimes feel that that's not as satisfactory as this sort of, sort of getting people in one big sort of blast uh, to sort of have a go and gen generate ideas. You know. uh, so I don't have an answer. I just, but you said well, what's the, the problem? And for me, that's... Uh, 
I think uh, something I sort of struggle a little bit with uh, with, with 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 my students, and I'm, I'd be happy for advice on mm -hmm. how, how to uh, overcome that. Yeah, I think you know, there's a, there's always if you're if you're teaching, you're always wondering about how much impact you're having, um, and it's always really hard to set up the exact process that's going to have the most impact because it's not you know it's never one on one with some groups you kind of feel like you have a lot of chemistry and it just kind of just works really well and you don't feel like you've done anything particularly interesting or special and it just kind of happens. And then other times, you know, you've put in so much effort that you just can't get this group in exactly the right place. Um, I, I think I believe a lot in one-on-one in -on -one teaching and also students teaching each other. So I think setting up a really, really strong environment that encourages um, people to be responsible and to do a lot of learning themselves is, in, in my experience has been very very successful um, but I guess for me personally it's always the personal factor is really hard if I'm you know if I'm if I'm um, coaching someone you know if I'm really getting the best out of them you know like what what is you know there's they're always tailored solutions you're always trying to figure out how to get this student in this particular place so that they can get the most out of themselves and yeah, and sometimes you succeed, and sometimes you don't. And it's, I think it's um, maybe maybe it gets better over the years, but maybe it just doesn't. <laughs> um, yeah, for me, I suppose the biggest problem I I've encountered in years of teaching and working on projects is the romantic notion that creativity is somehow otherworldly and opposed to function. Um, I think the greatest. Uh, artistic productions have been a combination of creativity and practical or technical knowledge. So the idea that, and I think you pick this up exactly, Max, the creative has somehow moved beyond somebody who even ever produces something and somehow um, is this thing and just wafts through and in their wake what you actually get is a lot of A4 pieces of paper and nothing much substantial. Um, and I can see why you move to the idea of the artist as the producer of something as well as being creative. So I think that is a really quite a problem and this is a problem when you have teams because when you start presenting a team and say this is the engineer and this is the creative, the engineer gets pushed into that box and the, we're back to the labels. Uh, it can be thinking about the fact that it is somehow otherworldly and isn't connected to the realities of making uh, can be quite a damaging aspect. Having somebody who quite likes doing the finance sheets as well as being creative is a very rare individual, but they tend to be very, very successful. Thank you. That's very helpful to me for my, yeah, for my research. Yeah. Do we um, have any final anyone? questions? Yeah. Um, just very briefly, I'm here because I know Max. Um, I'm also from Taiwan. I'm here in UK as a trainee psychotherapist, but previously I had an experience in international corporates as a PR communication professional. So it's very interesting listening to this talk um, and ideas from yours. And I guess uh, because of my psychology and communications background, I, I'm wondering, um, Three of you are educators in, in design, and um, it seems that a lot of the, the issues you were discussing comes from communication and different personalities. Um, I'm just curious, uh, how are you integrating um, communication uh, or trainings in communication or, uh, or, or a ways of learning how to teamwork in terms of how are you incorporating that in your um, teaching, I guess, or the, the teaching programs? Well, if I, as I mentioned, if I actually uh, we eliminated the teaching pro <laughs> the uh, team <laughs> team program, which uh, um, I think because the department had a very strong ethos of bringing out the individual in fact you know in in the, in the fashion design department it, it you know, um so uh 
I think actually it would be very good to introduce some uh, more team-based, uh, collaborative sort of uh, um, uh, sort of projects in, in in that environment. Again, with my students, you you absolutely I think you very important for them not only to be able to obviously do the work, but be able to communicate it, be able to articulate it to other people, and to use different media and things to do that. So again, in the workshop, students all have to produce a video, you know, explaining the concept and how the garment works, who would use it, why would they use it, those sorts of things. And, and that's part of the examination at the, uh, 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 at the end. It's not just a catwalk, it's, you know, they have to put the whole background and, and, and things. Um, it's, it's more a struggle for the Taiwan students because they have to do it to me and it, they have to do it in English, so it's a, a bit of a, um, uh, a, a even more, a, more of a, a struggle, I suppose, uh, um, for them, but it, it, it does get them thinking about those sort of, uh, sort of very basic issues and uh, 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 you know, being taken out of their comfort zone to present them. Yeah. I haven't had to teach teamwork that much, but I think, I think if people would ask me about teamwork, I do, I do think it's very important to, to have shared responsibility. So, um, you know, I think we've talked about this a little bit. Not to silo off everyone and say like you're the one who does this and you're the one who does this, and the rest kind of just waits for them to finish their thing. I think it's, um, you know, you you are all responsible responsible for this one person succeeding. Um, so it's it's about sort of facilitating for each other what you need and making sure that, you know, even though people take responsibility for different parts, um, there is there is you know like in in a team you can never say well, well we failed because this person didn't do this one thing, um, that 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 shouldn't be able to happen basically <laughs> because uh, you know you need to you need to find ways for that person to succeed. Um, thinking back, I, I must say now I. I uh, currently teach PhD students, so apart from the lecture format, which is an incredibly structured arrangement between a person at the front and a lot of people in, in front of them, um, I don't uh, engage in a lot of team teaching per se, but uh, from the years when I did in terms of teaching undergraduate students or MA students, or actually teaching students who were learning to teach, uh, one of the big, biggest issues in art and design is the presentation, the crit, in which all sorts of social arrangements start to become manifest and long-term friendships and grudges will express themselves in. Mm -hmm. And you have to manage this and the students have to learn how to manage this. In fact, it's quite interesting when you talk to people who in other disciplines, how important a part of an artist or designer's training, the crit situation is, because it is a time when you learn how to present your creative productions in front of other people and possibly defend them to an maybe antagonistic audience. It's an incredibly difficult learning experience, but one that when people learn how to manage it, they do quite well. So I think it's one of the, it's a very interesting aspect of the art and design education in the UK is the emphasis on this when it's played well. As a student myself, I was a foreign student in the Netherlands which had a completely different system and I, I found it quite fascinating. I suddenly realised that um, how unique a UK education was in terms of that. Um, but we all take it for granted. So it's quite an interesting thing. It's the fish never knows the water that it's swimming in because we're in it all the time. And I think that's one of the, the key aspects of teaching in the discipline. Yeah, um, it's, it's not so much a, a, a question, it's more a kind of comment or reflection on um, just the value, really, of this kind of dialogue and exchange for um, practice-led research process here at the Royal College, creative practice. Um, and I was just thinking that in, in each of the presentations, there was at least one really key element that is so, alive, so much alive in the experience of the practitioners here, the creative research practitioners. And I was thinking that um, your work, Peter, in comparing sort of different theories of ethnography, doing the kind of literature search, and taking great pleasure, really, in finding who the kind of um, 
the fellow travellers have yeah. been and yeah. who you can follow and who you might learn from. And there was a real kind of pleasure about knowing the history of the discipline. And I think that's something that is very often discovered in the process of becoming a researcher. And I thought Max's wonderful comment about having discovered kind of personal failure at just about everything and then <laughs> finding the only way to triumph over kind of the catastrophes of personal failure was to become a really good designer of the entrepreneurial uh, aspect of and, and how to, uh, yeah, that, that research is something that is designed. It's not only kind of following rules. It's not only being compliant with kind of scholarly practices. It's actually something that is an entrepreneurial skill. And I thought that that was to my mind, beautifully expressed in your presentation in a very joyous kind of way. And I thought that, that Paul's description of the ability to work with the Shi Chen students was again about the, the real pleasures of that kind of collaboration. There was something absolutely joyous about that. But um, the thing I think that moved me most was when Melissa was talking about how working with the children um, really, uh, they're not quite consumers, they're not quite end product users, they're more kind of co-designers, really, mm. in the research process. There was that moment where she found that the children's play and what they valued was not what she had imagined that they might value. And it's that sense of discovering something completely unexpected, where the research generates some kind of knowledge that almost arrives back at the researcher almost as a shock of something that was not expected. And that sense of learning from one's own research. Um, and I just thought that all of these very different experiences in very different areas of professional practice um, had so much to offer the researchers within the Royal College of Art practice-led research program. And before we ran out of time, I just really wanted to thank Amy and Eve absolutely really thank you so much both of you for taking the trouble to leave your individual desks and to collaborate and to bring everybody together and to invite all the people you most wanted to hear from and um uh, well yes i want to want to say thank you to Scott um, from the AV to help us on the recording the event. Uh, probably somewhere under there or yes, I can't really <laughs> see him at the moment, but Scott, thank you. And thank you so much, Claire, for your support from the uh, Fashion and Textile Research. I say, yeah, thanks again. Uh, we'd really welcome your feedback today because we hope to be this event to be the first of many discussions. Our next stop is in New York, Research Alive New York, in November. Thanks again. <laughs>